but yeah well it's a process too oh it certainly it's certainly and it has to work it's itself a process out. and a learning experience on top of that mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I all i can say is um you'll be a better person for it <laughs> are you sure about that <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> but those are my words of encouragement to you. <laughs> well, uh, surely you must believe that it is possible, relatively speaking, to create mm -hmm. better systems. Uh, yes, no, I, I do, I do. My 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 amazement is that we don't <laughs> that that it always ends up so so muddled. You know, I mean, we 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 place our lives in this technologies hands and and i can't get my email to work all the time you know and it's like well if you can't do that i'm not sure i want to entrust you with landing my airplane when i'm flying you know that, that's the, that's just kind of the feeling that i have you know when i'm aloft and whatnot mm -hmm. it, it should it should be you know it, it really should be but it's not, but how much can you trust yourself? Uh, for example, driving versus flying, right? Mm -hmm. We know statistically that flying is safer than, yeah. than driving. Yeah. Now, in, in an, an accident, you may be at fault. Somebody else mm -hmm. may be at fault. It's probably, or it's often a co combination of factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you driving solo or whoever you are, are yeah. maybe a, a less resilient system than... Mm -hmm. Uh, an entire you know industry devoted to air tra traffic safety. Right? Yes. Not that yes. there aren't accidents, of course, but mm -hmm. I believe that statistically the number of accidents you know mm -hmm. per number of flights has been decreasing. So there is improvement there, and probably could be improved further. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, that's a high risk situation. There's a lot of you know. There's not only lives on the line. There's uh, money on the line huge uh, business. So there's mm -hmm. much incentive, of course, to avoid those kinds of uh, disasters. But with your email, it's not, it's as, not, uh, as... not as high stakes. Uh, so if it doesn't work... Well, I'll go back to your, your, your starting point. Relatively speaking, that, that email might be my great breakthrough as an author. You know, mm -hmm. it could be very high stakes. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, so to me, you, you have to be able to do the one and the other. But it's and 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 I and I have a lot of faith and a lot of trust in 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 systems. I know that there's a pilot up in the cockpit, but I I also know that he's not always flying the plane. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the system is doing it, and I just have a let's say a fundamental curmudgeony mistrust <laughs> of systems, especially when we don't understand how they're working. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's part of the problem that we have. I, you know, you, you deal enough with these technical issues. And when you ask someone about it, it goes, well, oh, the first answer is always, well, it shouldn't do that. Well, I know it shouldn't do that, but it's doing it. <laughs> you know, you're not making me feel better that your first response is, well, I shouldn't have to think about this, but that's actually what you always have to think about is the things that don't work as well. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I, I know I'm not as, uh, oh, how should I put this? I, I actually find it more amusing than, than threatening, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm one of those people that's like, well, okay, well, whatever. I, you know, I'm getting to the point where hmm, if tomorrow's the last day, it's the last day, you know, uh, new adventure, off we go. But mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for younger folks, the world looks a little different, mm -hmm. you know, so. Well, may maybe this has to do with different views of, of our potential. Something. Like I think that. it does. And I think it, I, I, and I'll tell you another thing, Mark, you are the master of the seg, you know, <laughs> 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 yeah, really. I, this is, I mean, I admire many of your talents, but that, that's the one I was like, oh, man, yeah, that's pretty always, manage is always just true. You know, just kind of flip it over. Excellent. Again, good show. Well, and with that, I suppose we could welcome John and Doug. Yeah, there they are. Great. Hello. Hi. <laughs> we were just chatting, waiting for you guys to show up. 
It sounds like uh, technical issues. Uh, did you get my memo by email or by chance? Or uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got I'll, it. I'll have my bot look into it. <laughs> so, speaking of technical issues, my laptop is the charger is kerplunk right now, for lack uh-huh. of a better word. It's not working, so I'm switching to phone view here. Luckily, I have multiple devices. Uh, don't we all? But, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming in fine, Doug. Yeah, yeah actually better. Yeah. I sent that audio static. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, I'll try to stick to this route. Uh, we'll see if my battery on this phone lasts long enough. So okay. are we recording us- yet? Have we started? We Have are we- recording. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, this records from the moment that somebody shows up. You know, so okay. That's why Marco gets to do a lot of editing before this uh, actually show- <laughs> gets placed in the public view. Speaking of tasks that I would like to delegate to technology, <laughs> <I bet. laughs> but Mark, Marco, uh, John, and I had a, a brief talk about how to kind of take technology into multiple hands and multiple minds mm-hmm. about how we're going to branch off this video chat and everything like that. So he's, I have he's my, placing the frustration on all of us. Oh, I, ha- I, I have my the signal? bells. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we did discuss kind of how to start out this talk. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mentioned to both Marco and John that in the voice of John, like for me, for this to be useful, I'm going to view myself as the baby bird up in a nest and mm-hmm. I'm learning to fly. So I need you guys to kind of, once I come back up for the second round or the third round of flights, I need you guys to kind of keep me um, there, keep me in the process of learning. That's what this, this mm-hmm. entire Cosmos Cafe is about for me personally is I, I it, it's a question I had and I'd like answers, whether it comes from my mind or anybody else's mind or, a comment on uh, wherever this is posted, YouTube page or uh, Mm -hmm. the the Cosmos Cafe on Infinite Conversations, then so be it. But hopefully we can flesh out some potentials here. Um, And then what my hope is for all of you, from me, once you do get talking, I I might rudely interrupt you. Um, And I I mentioned... uh, both Marco and John about the crab mentality um, that the Filipinos are known for. My, my wife was one of 300 in a village and uh, approximately, and she's the only one to have gone to college mm-hmm. and she often gets the crab mentality pulling her back. So the crab mentality is there's all these crabs within the bottom of the bucket and they're all trying to get out, but they're always constantly pulling each other back down to that same lower level in a certain sense. So, but I want to see that in a positive sense. I, like I, once some of you go branching off too far um, with your mentality, I will drag you back in, or we can all do that to each for each other. Um, drag each other back in and ask a question like, "Where are you going with this?" Or okay, like so that. you, so you, I'm, I'm just wanting to get clear about this metaphor. You want us to pull each other back into the pail. Mm-hmm. Correct. I mentioned that this is a, a slow time mm-hmm. thought process um so it can i, I ask I hope it takes it when you when you want to interrupt us or redirect our attention can you do it without being rude or is rudeness part of the process <laughs> for the four of us here we are we are of course friends we know each other so okay. it, it might come off as rude to somebody who doesn't know us Okay. But just so I'm alerted, I just don't want to. End. Uh, I could not to imagine be rude anything is, other than a benevolent rudeness <laughs> from you. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine you being rude, but you know, I, I know I may have seen you on, at, at your best. <laughs> <laughs> rudeness, rudeness is a very relative thing. If I can just right, throw can in you guys, a little, uh, hmm? please shut up right now. All right, I'm hmm? trying to uh, jump right into it here. How's that? Is that pretty good? Okay. All right. Good, good, good. (laughs) No. um, 
So a quick summary to those who haven't, who might be watching this now. Um, so we have me. I'm the one that started this with some um, thought I had over the holidays when I was at my parents. Um, I mentioned I didn't have, I don't have TV, no cable, nothing like that. So I was watching on a high definition TV, these nature videos um, of a Japanese puffer fish of uh, uh, some sort of spider dance mating ritual. And all of these really caught my eye, so to speak, and really made me think, well, I, I was just in awe that these animals or insects can just reach such depth and a sort of perfection or a completion of their, their dance and life. Um, so if anybody's interested, go on to the videos later on to see this. But I, I just, I see that as something that's missing in our life. We, like, if we examine like the sexual aspect of our life, we're nowhere near being complete in that sense. We have 10 million things that are going in on our mind, going on in our mind when these things occur. And so the sexual, even the playful or um, the ritual type of aspects in our life, they're, they're all over the place. We have different groups. We have different human races or <laughs> I'm going off topic here, but uh, basically we don't know exactly who we are or we're barely touching the surface of what we can be. So when I ask the question, like what is the ultimate human species potential? Um, there's, that's a pretty loaded question. Uh, so there's a list of questions here and for fear that I'm reaching my five minute, six minute limit of my own personal speaking ability. <laughs> I'd like for some of you to maybe pick out, I know we, I had the, the voting session there for the, but we all pretty much picked every single question. So uh, if, <clears throat> yeah, except for Ed, of course. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but the, So the top question was the, the one about faculties, I think. Or no, no. So the top question that everybody picked what was, do all signs point towards an exploration of mind to better understand our humanness? Or can we learn to fix or separate from nature by improving what we already know? So we can either start with that question, or if any of you would like to just jump in with your pre-meditation thoughts on this process, um, please go right ahead. If not, I'll... We'll see what happens. And while you're sitting there thinking for a moment, I do have, I, I would like to get, I guess for me personally, which is a newer question that popped up in my attempt three, there's three attempts now of trying to articulate what I mean. So in attempt three, I think the, the faculties will come up and enter subjectivity. So the question for the faculties is, do we have the necessary faculties to understand ourselves and the world around us. So I'd like to get to that at some point, uh, but we don't necessarily have to jump into that first. Could, could you repeat that, Doug? So the faculties come up and then what? So the question is, do we have the necessary faculties or senses to understand ourselves and the world around us? And I guess this goes back to my, the, the kind of integral plateau tapestry thing I mentioned, like we do have all sorts of information, but it's also a very limited information um, or our perception of what we can be um, or what we do have is, is still very limited, but we, we can kind of start to see which direction would be the right direction to go into. Um, I, I can offer my meditation on this briefly, as briefly as I can. Uh, the, I first saw this video of the white pufferfish a few months ago. It was sent to me by a fellow named Brian George, 
who is an author uh, whose work we published on metapsychosis. And when I first saw it, I was amazed, as I think many people uh, would be or have been. Uh, and something in me was a little bit terrified as well. And I, I, re- I, reply, I replied along those lines that, that what I was seeing in that act or in that image, uh, I could relate to. Uh, and felt like something that I do, that I'm in the midst of in this sort of mandalic sense. Like we're, I feel like we're creating a mandala. And I think also if we look at it anthropologically or historically or mythologically, we'll see these kinds of large-scale distributed consciousness created forms that whose purpose doesn't seem to be for utility in the sense that we would understand that in modern terms, but which seems to be some form of communication, some way of getting the attention of another, attracting that attention, and then uh, for a process to happen, a, a reproductive process, a sexual process. In this case, the white pufferfish, that moment, that event of the eggs and sperm coming together, I think three minutes or three seconds or something. One of the um, orders of magnitude less than the time (laughs) it takes to put together this whole discipline, right? And what was terrifying is the thought that I might be involved in something like that. Half unwittingly, uh, half just by instinct. And so the thought of a complete human potential or ultimate human potential depend it is a kind of loaded term and I, I think it would not be a bad idea to sense into different ways that that is is loaded uh however i think it does point to something sort of opens up a, a space in the, in the direction of this exploration of like what is it this all about like what are we actually creating here and by here i don't necessarily mean like in this conversation or in whatever activities we're doing personally. I mean, that I think is part of something that has this much faster uh, dimensionality to it. And when, you, when I feel that, it's, uh, it's quite, um, well, it, it leaves me a little bit speechless. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Marco. Um, and that that's that's partly the conclusion I, I drew was that yes, it, it is branching out into the direction of where we can go. Um, so what you're saying if I'm hearing it correctly is you, you said you were a little bit frightened in a certain sense? Yes, but not in the, not in, in a sort of metaphysical sense, like a metaphysical uh, panic or something like that. I, I, I would, kind of, kind of our, our smallness maybe, or in a different sense. What comes to mind, this is, I hope this is not too egghead uh, ish, is Kant, Immanuel Kant's uh, description of the sublime, which is a kind of awe before and a, you know, a fear before, something that is so, yeah, so much bigger and more powerful than you. And, and, and mixed with, in, in his, uh, his articulation of it mixed with a, somewhat of a safe distance. So the, the sublime is not the same as terror. It's not like outright terror as if bombs were falling on your city or something like that. There is some reflective distance. And at the same time, there is that you're up, you're up at the edge of what your psychophysical <laughs> vehicle can handle in terms of the, uh, the sense of, the, of power. So it's some, it's some confrontation with power or some encounter with power that I think is 
is entailed because there's there's something incredibly powerful about uh well it's this this notion of what we are capable of or what we might be uh compared to what conventionally or narratively we're uh, pre-programmed to believe that we are thank you marco um, ed or john any thoughts Oh, I know we both have lots of thoughts, <laughs> but, but uh, John, do you want to go? No, I'm slowing down. Okay, you're so you said that you were. All right, and then let me let me pick up on a couple of things. Um, I find it very interesting what Marco just said about fear and awe. Um, as I mentioned in, in in one of the last cafes, I've been trying for the last uh, four years to to learn biblical Hebrew, and the the verb in Hebrew uh, means both. It's to fear and be in awe. And so when we're reading the Old Testament, a lot of times we hear about you know, God showing up and we're all afraid and this and whatnot. But a lot of times it's just we're in awe. And and they are very, very closely related. Uh, Gapes are also, um, sorry for bringing them up, but um, he also goes into this in, in, in some depth because he talks about the numinous, and that's exactly what, what I hear uh, Marco describing. It's that you're so close to something that is so real in, in, the, in the truest sense of the word that you actually get weak in the knees when you're there. And you don't know whether you should be happy or, or afraid that you're there. And, and, and I think, for me, this is the curmudgeon speaking now, that's a good thing. Sometimes I think it's actually really good to have the shit scared out of you. I mean, existentially scared out of you. Because it puts things in a, on another level, if you will, that we don't normally engage. But if I go back to the fish, I, I, saw, I, I, I think things like that are absolutely fantastic. I could watch nature videos from morning until evening. That's why I generally don't watch them, because I find them addictive. Um, and, and I see this little fish running around, and he's making this geometrical form. And I thought, this is one of the most fantastic things I've ever seen. And it's like Marco said, it takes him, I don't know, orders of magnitude longer to do this than the result that comes out of it for the literally those couple of eggs that get uh, that that get uh, impregnated afterwards and at the end i go but does the fish know that and does the fish care and then i ask I myself to... well, can, can i add fish... that that huh? on the design which wasn't mentioned in the video that it also cleans up shop or it cleans yeah, up its it design does. It does all that and stuff and it takes, it does but it takes the shells Exactly. And places it them does in the certain preparation, spots. Preparation, and as I like to say, the postpiration as well. But you know that that all belongs to the job. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a supervisor capacity and you told somebody to do something and leave the crap laying all over the place. Well, part of the thing is getting it ready, doing what you're going to do, and putting the stuff away when you're done. And most people forget to put in your way when you're done. Well, the fish does that, but does the fish know it? Does it have any? conception of how long that took for what the results are and and my my own personal feeling is no it doesn't and then i ask myself can the fish say i'm not doing it are there puffer fish who go i'm not making the design and i don't think there are i think that's they do that because that's what they do that's, that's part of their fishness. That's part of their puffer fishness. Other fish do that other way. But we, we, have, we have such a privileged position that we can look at this and think there are, there are layers and depth of meaning that are not necessarily in what's there because we react to them and interact with them in much different ways because we're different creatures. So we can have, I truly believe, I have a feeling of awe, just like Marco does. But I don't know if the fish does. 
I don't, I don't get it from his, I'm going to do my business and I'm going to put this all together and I'm going to take it all apart and I'm going to do what I do. And he's going to go off and he's going to do it again next year or next month or however off they're doing. I don't know how they do it, but I don't think he's asking himself, was that really the best pattern I, or the circle or the design that I could have made? I don't think he, I don't think they ask themselves that. Maybe they do. I would really love to find out if they do, but I don't think that they do. I don't think that they need to. I think that they at some point will come to the, maybe to that place where they will ask themselves that. But for the most part, they do what they do because that's what they do. And there is a completeness in that. And, and, I, and, and, it's, and it's a wonderful inspiration for me as someone who doesn't always do what he has to do because it has to be done. I can take that as an inspiration, but it's not the end of what I do. I've got other things to do as well. And that's, that's where my ambivalence in the, in the whole thing comes in because I actually, it's, um, it's stated to, oh, what's the, what's the word? It's stated to um, specifically for what I actually mean, but I think that's all the fish can do and that's all the fish needs to do even though perhaps sometime later in the evolution of fish, it will see, seem differently. But for our discussions now, it's, the fish is closed, but we're open. And that's the difference. And so we can put meaning in things where it's not evident that the fish has meaning in that, even though it is a form of communication. It is a way to attract mates. It is a way to do a lot of those things. I don't know that the fish is aware of that. And that, that, to me, is a very fundamental difference between me and the fish. It's the, uh, the level of awareness that's involved. That's so would you, would you say that we're already complete then? No. I don't think, I don't think we are, nor should or we be. Have reached... Or so, so we won't, based on your understanding of what it means to be human... You don't foresee us. I mean, we we might project or cur- progress into the future, but mm-hmm. we are where we are because that's where we are. We are and where no, we are. Will there be a slow development, or is it a cycle back, like a slow development towards a better understanding potentially, or is it going to be the continual cycle? No, I, I I I I think that. That's a very interesting question, Doug. Um, I don't think we go back to anything. I think that there is a way of envisioning how things function that's cyclical. I'm a very big fan of that whole mythic cyclicalness, for example. But I don't think we go back to anything. Um, It's like scrambling an egg. You can't unscramble it. And once you awaken, let's say, I'll put this in Gapesarian terms. Once you go from mythical to mental consciousness, you can't go back. You can, you can build on, work from, tune into, utilize. Um, you can do a lot of things with it, but you can't go back to it. You can't get rid of the mental part. And should we ever make that step to integral, you can't go back. That, that's, that's what it means to move along. That's, that's the whole idea of supersession. You, you, you move forward. That is what uh, Jung was, try, I think, trying to express in his, in his process model. Well, you go through this, but you can't go back. We can't become animals. We can't become molecules again. We, we use all of that stuff to do other things because we have a whole different trajectory. So we can't go back. So you're talking about Arthur Jung? which I'm only basing it on the V that I know. And yes, I yes, yes. Assume... that's his process model. Yeah, that's it. Pra- practically the only thing I ever talk about. So yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. I, I would assume we're at maybe, I don't know the exact point, but on the V, we are on the central point. No, no, that's where crystals are. If crystals. you take that V, he comes down and he goes, there's light, there's photons, there's um, atoms, molecules, and then what he would call, he would call crystals. And then so we're, on moves, the, we're on the upside. Now we go up the up right side of the V, up the other side of the V, and there we have plants, animals, humans, and whatever. 
I just looked at a book the other day. I forgot the author right now. Mm -hmm. Something El Elgin, Elgin, maybe uh, the Living mm -hmm. Universe. Dwayne Elgin. Yes. Yeah. But he he has this kind of maybe it's more of an evolutionary model rather than um, Young's model. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. has this kind of at that point where we've reached where we can be to mm -hmm. a certain extent, and then but to improve, I guess, and maybe this will be the direction I'd like the conversation to go yeah. is yeah. like can't it might not be a cycle it might just be a v where we're a reflective mm -hmm. point jumping out into something else that we yes still have unknown so what would i guess this is for all of us what would that look like mm -hmm. so we're this is kind of my my the plateau i'm talking about the tapestry we, we've kind of we understand who we are mm -hmm. we, we've got the knowledge all in front of us it might the tapestry might just be for our psychological well-being rather than how to become God or light or immortal or whatever, what have you, that uh, we can um, only imagine at this point. Um, but we have that knowledge of how to make the world a better place, to have peace on earth and those type of things. And we clearly have a lot of work to do. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> But um, just, just to throw this in, um, it, one of the things that, that bothered a lot of people about Darwin's model of evolution is it starts at the bottom and goes up. It, it, there's just an advance. And then the 19th century, this whole idea of what is progressive and moving forward and becoming better and whatnot, that, that's where that comes in. But in all the spiritual traditions of the world, and Aurobindo brings this out, very well, I think. I haven't read a lot of them, but the little bit that I have, and Moorhoff uh, brings this out in the little talk that he had, because he says specifically in that interview, Aurobindo's position is you can't have evolution without involution. So he says very specifically, you start and then you go back up, and it's that same kind of V pattern. And this U of return, you know, the falling into matter, the Gnostics call it, and then ascending into whatever is a V pattern. Houston Smith uh, actually discusses this in very uh, modern philosophical, standard philosophical terms in his, um, I think it's the forgotten truth. I'd, I'd have to look which one it actually is. Or is okay, it doesn't matter. But, but basically, there's this idea of descent and ascent. And almost all spiritual traditions in the world have this U-shaped or V-shaped or whatever it is, start at the top, come down and go back up again. We have to regain what we've lost kind of thing. So there is a very fundamental difference between, let's say, a materialistic approach to how things are going and one that is more transcendent or spiritual. And, and, all is, and what it speaks of, and this is the thing I like about the title that you have, it talks about potential. You know, I don't think, I heard this my entire school career, you know, you're not living up to your potential, Ed. You're not doing what you could be doing. And most of the time I was telling them, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I had very particular reasons why I had to be an anti. I guess that's why I became a curmudgeon in my old age, um, because I still feel that way. And I don't, I don't think that we're using even the, a slight bit of our potential that we could be using. That's, that's why I agree with you 100%. We need to think a lot harder and longer and more intensely about, well, what should we be doing with ourselves? But the should question is the ethical question. That's something that we touched on in the last uh, talk that we had, too. That's where I see a tie-in to what we're doing yeah. here. You know, what should I think? Be? I yeah. think that, well, obviously, that goes with the intersubjectivity. Um, yeah. So, so I guess for, so we can, I, w I want to hear from Marco and John. Mm -hmm. Or John, who I hasn't spoken, what's going on? I don't know. But, um, I feel like being quiet for a while. So you guys go ahead and talk. I'm taking notes. God. Gotcha. <clears throat> well, let me, if I may interject here um, on the question of the ethical and intersubjectivity, I think one of the ways in which and th this is going to be the critic coming out uh, around n n nothing about this talk, but about the question itself and why I think it's loaded. And, and that is that I think if you frame uh, a, a kind of group goal or aspiration in terms of fulfilling a collective human potential, 
it's difficult not to turn that into a totalitarian kind of stance, a totalitarian kind of approach, because you have some idea, some vision of what that ultimate potentiality is. It could be very benevolent. It could be very visionary. It could be beautiful. But insofar as the, um, the, an attempt is made to impose or to enforce or to distribute or to get everybody lined up just in the right way to achieve that vision, it incurs a, uh, a, a, a kind of a violence, let's say. Uh, or it, would t- it tends, I think, to lead in that direction. So I think the trick is to have an understanding of potential because clearly it does mean something to be able to open into a higher way of being. Like there is something that we're intuiting that you're pointing to with that term, which is better than, greater than, beyond where we are at now. And I think that the grief and the anger and disappointment with the state of the world really, you know, puts a, lights a fire under our butt to, to, to get to, you know, to, to collaborate better, to get our act together, to achieve some kind of more collective human potential. But the trick is how to articulate that in a way that leaves enough room for the diversity of um, goals, desires, uh, dispositions, preferences, etc., which is in fact the case. Now, this gets back to Arthur Young, because he has an, an interesting way of handling this. And it comes out in the distinction that he makes between what he calls the, the group soul of animals, which in, on his in his model are, you know, they're on the right side of the V, they're mm-hmm. like a step up, but they're not where humans are. He says that if you look at the animal kingdom, there are, you know, a, a, multi, a, you know, multiplicitous forms, many, many myriad forms, and each of them has a kind of group soul among them. So in, there's a way that we could talk about the group soul of lions or the group soul of white pufferfish. This is something that they share. This is something that they do. And it's something that doesn't require individual thought, reflection, or choice, or action. Although there is a very, very, there, there, is, some, there is some quantum of choice and freedom in that puffer fish's existence and consciousness. The next stage up in this model is not, or the, let's say that the, the achievement of potential for humans, Arthur Young doesn't see as a group achievement. He looks at the individual soul as the venue or vehicle through which humans are realized as humans. And the analogy that he makes is this, that if you look at, m- most people are kind of the same. I mean, variations in skin complexion, slight variations in height, but morphologically, we all, you know, we all have the same body schema, similar brain schema, but where we find incredible differentiation, the way that we find differentiation, a myriad of forms in the animal kingdom, is in the forms of our individuality. And he says that not all people kind of achieve their soul, that the soul is something that, in a sense, and he qualifies this a bit, is, is achieved through the work of self-realization, the work of actualization. Uh, And it doesn't necessarily, in fact, it has to differentiate from the group soul of humanity. It can't be a herd uh, activity. Uh, And that's what makes it different. And that's also, though, what allows for this sort of meta-flourishing, this meta-potential realization that doesn't have to be... uh, uh, contained within a singular totalitarian kind of s- schema. That's, how, that's I think, I mean, that, uh, that's his v- model. I'm not saying that's the truth. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think it's a useful, it could be a useful thing to consider in the context of the conversation because it kind of shifts the sort of, I don't know, like shifts the, the focus a little bit in terms of group, individual, and what we're talking about. Because even as individuals, we still are profoundly intersubjective. So what does individuality mean? What is an individual soul without, without others? And then that, again, 
returns us to the intersubjective and the ethical. And that's, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. Can I add one little thing to that? It's only the case if you postulate that this potential is something specific. I don't think that, I don't think that Young, what I like about Young is the same thing I like about Gapeser. Once you go through a stage, you don't throw it away. You take it with. So you take everything with you that you've had and you build upon that. And I agree with you 100% that when somebody says, this would be the best thing for all of us, my vote is no. I don't care what you're saying. My vote is no. Because that's violating, for me, the principle of openness, which is what I see unfolding through the system. The thing that I like about what we talked about with Tenen and these, these fundamental ethical issues that were involved, none of them said it should be like this. All of those golden rules that we find throughout the world are basically statements of don't be like that. Not do this, but don't do that. In other words, look at the other, deal with who's there, and treat that person as if you were that person. You don't have to be something better. You don't have to be something greater. You don't have to, you don't have to be anything. That comes as a, that's the natural course that this evolution or involution, evolution of this whole process is taking. This, you know, that's why I don't like the word better. You know, better is the, you know, the enemy of the good. Because in wanting to make it better, we, we concretize, we, we, try to, we try to make it specific. Into it's this thing and not that thing, and it's and it's not. One of the one of the, the the most wonderful things about human beings is as frustrating as it is. I'll be the first to admit it. Is that you never know what to expect. Anything can show up, and that and I think that's that's the that's the greatest thing about being human. You never know what's going to happen next. You can always stop and reflect and think about it and go, oh, is that a good thing? And oh, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but in retrospect, I mean, I don't know how many times have I gone through that in my life, you know? But at base, if I, if I think everybody else is like me and I don't want to do things to them that I don't want to do to myself, I'm not imposing any kind of totalitarianism. It, it, can it I interrupt? <clears throat> I'm, I've, I've limited myself. I agree. This is the thing I like. Uh, the other thing I like about Young's model, he talks about limitation and freedom, constraints and freedom. You know, and I'm not really limiting myself in a sense I am, but I would just like not to be a certain way because I wouldn't like other people to be that way to me. But it still leaves a whole wide range of things open. And all of that wonderful creative potential that I believe every human being has and very few human beings use does not get restricted in any way. You know, it's the don't be an asshole guideline. It's really not much more than that. You know, like there's a one rule. But it's not we will be this. It's let's not be something else. And I think that's a, a very distinct uh, uh, distinction that we, we can think about. I think we finally got John to jump in here. Well, I feel called upon. Thank you. <laughs> but I was waiting for that call. Okay. Um, I was sitting outside the organic food restaurant eating a granola bar and an elderly gentleman with a cane he was walking by and he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you look like a romantic poet. And then he tipped his hat to me, continued to walk. And then I saw a group of young Asian women. They were teenagers. They all had balloons. And one of these young ladies, they were all giggling among, among each other. And she, came, she walked up to me giggling. She handed me 
some balloons. <laughs> That's all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Very nice. Excellent. So let's let's rein in what Marco said about Young, which is new information for me. Um, that I can understand the individual. coming before the group as a necessary point. And I can see that model as being very useful and applicable for this conversation. So, hello, Jeffrey. Oh, well, yeah, he's got a video thing now. He'll be back. Okay, yeah. Uh, so going off of that, I, I had a few thoughts and going off of what you said, Ed, and maybe I'll throw in a few John elements too. Hmm. Don't, there's not much going on up there, no balloons. But um, when I initially saw these videos, I, I do have knowledge of Arobindo, little bit, what little I know of Gebser, the integral models, mm -hmm. the the intellectual side of this conversation we could be having. But when I was in in the zone, I I was. I saw the playful, the sexual side of it, and my mind, I, I cannot come up with a totalitarian regime for society as a whole. That's, I'm not capable of that because there is infinite potential in any moment, even with one aspect such as the playful. Um, there's no, each culture, each individual has a different idea. Same with the, the sexual. We are all completely different. There's, no, there's not going to be one set way to do the act, ever. E even if there is, there's still going to be the mind running in the background of an image of something you saw today that sparks your fantasy world or what have you in that realm. Um, so... One, I guess kind of like Marco mentioned at the beginning, once you start thinking of, well, what's, what about the mental? What, what about the psychological? What about the aesthetic or the, the room around you? How can you best arrange that for the human? So there, there's so much to think about. So to, like you're saying, Ed, to limit anything is to limit the human. And... Going back to the, maybe, maybe we can explore the, the senses, the faculties that we have to explore our world around us. Um, I might read uh, the Harari Homo Deus book here in a second. There's a little segment in there that, that kind of has, that sparked the question. Um, but something I, going off of this, something that is the reason I'm interested in slow time is because of somebody like Harari who takes two months out of the year to go to a, a meditation center. He doesn't write, he doesn't read, he doesn't do anything. He just spends two months meditating. And he comes up, not that he's intentionally going in there so he can write a bestseller or something like that. He's doing that because he intuits that this is the best way to become the ultimate potential human. So going back to Jung, that's, that's the step, the individual step he can take. And then what he produces might have a collective influence, but it might be only a, a few moments for somebody that read it, like, oh, after you finish the book, you'll say, that's a nice book. I had some good thoughts. Or it could be somebody like me who was deeply influenced by it, maybe write an essay or two or have a conversation about it. Um, but to become Harari, to step into his realm, I can only do that for a brief moment because I'm the individual. So 
I don't know where I want to go with this now. I'm, I'm opening it up to too many possibilities. Maybe I'll uh, go ahead, John. Ken, if you go into Harari, I'd like to go into Jeffrey Kripal. Okay. Mm. I have a quote, and then I'd love to hear from Jeffrey. Mm. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. Jeffrey. Welcome Where aboard. Um, <laughs> this is uh, just a few paragraphs from his book, The Secret Body. For days, I had been participating in the annual Bengali celebration of the goddess Kali in the streets and temples of Calcutta. One morning, I woke up, but my body did not. I couldn't move. I was paralyzed like a corpse, more or less exactly like the Hindu god Shiva, as he is traditionally portrayed in tantric art, lying prostrate beneath Kali's feet. An incredibly subtle, immensely pleasurable, and terrifyingly powerful energy entered me, possessed me, completely overwhelmed me. My vibrating body felt as if I had struck a wall socket. My brain felt as if it had suddenly hooked up to some sort of occult internet and that billions of bits of information were being downloaded into its neural net. Or better, it felt as if my entire being was being reprogrammed or rewired. A door in the night, a portal had opened on this wall. All before, I felt uh, my soul or subtle body, or it still had a shape, being pulled out of the physical body by some sort of super invisible magnet. It goes on and talks about that experience, and I, I find this remarkably similar to. He he said this is he only had one such experience. I have this kind of experience three times a week, mm. um, sometimes more than that, sometimes a whole lot less. There's sometimes where months go by without any of the, any of these kinds of experiences, which is which is a good thing because then I have some opportunities to integrate. Um, but I think that the pufferfish, that uh, wonderful video that you shared, Doug, uh, what it evoked in me, besides what everyone else has shared, is a sort of ascetic pleasure in this fish's uh, activity. Um, but a big question, because I was looking at how was this data gathered? Awesome. It was an event that the announcer said it's like 24 seven, this puffer fish worked on this for I think several weeks. Mm -hmm. And some humans got together and have used technology in a way to capture this event so that we can reflect upon it and enjoy it and wonder about it. But the puffer fish, is communicating to another pufferfish for a certain purpose that pufferfishes have. Um, I think we're very, we are, we can tune in to the, the nature that has produced the pufferfish and produced ourselves while recognizing that we can do things, we have many more options than a pufferfish has. So if we are, um, what would it feel like, Doug? Or what you said, what does it look like, that human potential? I think that's what you said, Doug. Your question was what it would look like. I'm interested in what it sounds like, what it feels like, as well as what it looks like. I'm going to Me. stop you there because this is a perfect spot to read what I want to read from Homo Deus. Um, in the, pre, in the section before this, he is talking about um, Thomas Nagel's What is it like to be a bat? Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, but uh, he, Nagel's just exploring that we have no perception of what it is to be a bat. We can kind of intuit, we can think about it, we can maybe put on a special virtual reality experience for it, but we'll, we'll never know and nor will the bat know who we are. Um, but this is a section called I Smell Fear. Uh, this is after he, he's kind of, he's in the midst of discussing how we're going from a humanistic society to kind of techno-humanistic society, the algorithm, algorithms, all that stuff. So I think we can jump on in here and understand what he's getting at. 
but it ties in directly with what you're saying, John. So it's called, it's on page 364 if you ever happen to get the book um, or if you have the book and it's entitled, I Smell Fear. It says, as long as doctors, engineers, and customers focused on healing mental diseases are and enjoying life in weird societies, um, the study of subnormal mental states and weird minds was perhaps sufficient to our needs. So normative psychology is often accused of mistreating any divergence from the norm. In the last century, it has brought relief to countless people, saving the li lives and sanity of millions. However, at the beginning of the third millennium, we face a completely different kind of challenge. As liberal humanism makes way for techno-humanism, and medicine is increasingly focused on upgrading the healthy rather than killing the sick. Doctors, engineers, and customers no longer want to merely fix mental problems. They are now seeking to be acquiring the technical abilities to begin manufacturing new states of consciousness, consciousness, yet we lack a map of these potential new territories. Since we are familiar mainly with the normative and subnormative mental spectrum of weird people, the Western educated industrial uh, people, we don't even know what destination to aim towards. Not surprisingly, then, positive psychology has been the trendiest field of the discipline. So it goes on to kind of explain positive psychology. Uh, and then under such circumstances, we might rush forward without any map and focus upon upgrading those mental abilities that our current economic and political system needs while neglecting and even downgrading others. Um, so he, he kind of goes back to, it's called I Smell Fear because he's going back to how we could, it, it's been thought that we can smell fear um, and how it's different from courage. So when a man is afraid, he secretes different chemicals compared to when he is full of courage. Uh, if you sat among an archaic band debating whether to start a war against the neighbors, you could literally smell public opinion. As sapiens organize themselves into larger groups, noses lost much of their social importance because they are useful only when dealing with small numbers of individuals. You cannot, for example, smell the American fear of China. Consequently, human olfactory powers were neglected. Brain areas that tens of thousands of years probably dealt with odors were put to work on more urgent tasks such as reading, mathematics, and abstract reasoning. The system prefers that our neurons solve differential equations rather than smell our neighbors. And I won't, I'll spare you the rest, but he does say that um, in addition to spe smelling and paying attention, we have been losing our ability to dream. Here's where I thought of you, John. Uh, many cultures believe that what people see and do in their dreams is no less important than what they see and do while awake. Hence, people actively develop their ability to dream, to remember dreams, and even to control their actions in the dream world, which is known as lucid dreaming. Experts in lucid dreaming could move about their dream world at will and claim that they could even travel to higher planes of existence or meet visitors from other worlds. The modern world, in contrast, dismisses dreams and subconscious messages as subconscious messages at best and mental garbage at worst. Consequently, dreams play a much smaller, smaller part in our lives. Few people actively develop their dreaming skills, and many people claim that they don't dream at all or that they cannot remember any of their dreams. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there so you kind of get the picture of where he's getting at here. Um, so he, so given our faculties, given our senses and the other senses we, we have been discussing here and what we will probably jump into once we start with our Obendo and what we all know from Gabe Sir and the integral type of models that have been developed. Um, so I'd, I'd like us I'd like to hear some responses with uh, well, that. Well, I can, I, can, I can respond. Um, I believe that there are the physical senses, and you mentioned smell, as you, you're quoting your author there, and, and being able to smell fear and smell other things as well. Um, but I think there's the five senses, and then there's the Buddhist called the mind a sixth sense, but there are also transphysical senses. So we can hear, taste, smell, touch, see, and hear. 
in other dimensions. I would call those transphysical senses. And there are many, many more transphysical senses and many different arrangements of affect and information than are dreamed of in anyone's philosophy here on planet Earth. So I see the mind as basically, well, it's something that Bolte said. She said, the brain body is a portal through which the energy of who I am can be beamed into a 3D external space. And that's the way I think of myself. And I believe that there will be many more people who are able to access and we can, uh, these kinds of um, paranormal, what's now called paranormal or metanormal, and they will become the new normal. And I believe we will have a new human, as I think Arbindo is trying to flesh this out, as is Gebser rather than a, a transhuman or a posthuman. And I believe one aspect of this uh, new human or superhuman would be a heightened sensitivity to the natural world and animals, the lives of animals. And uh, we would know what our differences and similarities are. And we would also have a heightened sense of responsibility. And once more, just to return to a very brief statement that uh because i was interrupted there so i didn't get to finish what cry paul says which i think is very relevant to what your uh, author was saying he's talking about abductees commonly speak of cellular change that they have undergone before they are beamed through a wall or ceiling or star trek style it is as if an intense energy is separating every cell or even every molecule of their bodies after such experiences, moreover, they feel that powerful residual energies are left in their bodies as if stored in the cells themselves. That is exactly how it felt and still feels in my memory. It is almost as if some kind of direct right-brained mind-to-mind transmission took place as if those residual plasmic energies were encoded with ideas or structures that could not be languaged but could be stored and later intuited and consciously shaped in the mirror of other resonant or echoing authors until they could appear, now through the prism of the left brain's words as my books. So I think books and writing and reading are a uniquely human capacity. Animals read signs and we read signs and we are sign makers. We are communication devices. And in other dimensions, we have, to, we have to relearn how we're going to go about doing business, how we're going to communicate. Because a lot of the information we get, we don't have any models for or maps for. Yeah, so that's maybe one that's of where, where my question at this point is, and the one I have no answer to, and if anybody wants to rephrase this question, but yeah, what, so we, we have ideas at how to reach some sort of potential that each individual one of us has in our minds. And I, I keep wanting to bring this back into the collective. I, I want to bypass Arthur Young's stage of the individual individual, or at least bring it from higher up and say, let's, let's try to go together. And I, there's ways to do that as, as we mentioned with writing a book, or meditating, writing a deeply thought book, or having a deep conversation as we're doing now and allowing it to be out in the world. So how, how, how do we best go about this? How do we keep it grounded to where we're not a new age clan out here just saying, oh, uh, What do you something. mean by grounded? Who, who's deciding what's grounded and what's ungrounded? Exactly. That's what we, we turn this No one is, but grounded to those who, as a collectively, who, those who have forgotten how to dream. How do we include them? How do we include the biggest, the largest amount of people in our individual picture without being totalitarian? Um, how, how do we do that? Like, that that's, uh, let's take it back a notch is what I mean by grounded. Because mm. I'm with you and I'm ready to jump into your dreams because they're pretty cool. <laughs> but. So I have an issue with this uh, thing because we talk about, um, um, I mean, you were saying, Doug, yourself, uh, 
we have images in the minds, we have this idea that, uh, so there's a, a, a revolution going on right now uh, that's not fully engaged yet, that is in its process in cognitive science for the last uh, 40 years in cognitive science, cognitive science has built, been built on this idea that we have representations in our brains, that our neurological systems form representations that are some sort of encapsulation of the world, uh, and that we have all these images and representations in our mind. And the revolution that's going on is suggesting that that's not the case, that there aren't necessarily representations in the mind. What there is is a direct engagement between the neurological circuits and the perceptual systems of the body and the world. And there's something much more dynamic and constantly changing going on there than a storage of information, of, of representations, of images. It's pertinent to the question of potential because, uh, because potential is often thought of as a kind of... A, encapsulation or an, a move from a one state of cap encapsulation to another kind of encapsulation. And it's all focused around this idea of representation. And a lot of what we're discussing here in the Infinite Conversation site is a little bit closer to the new idea than the older ideas. So uh, it's more embodied more focused on the body experiences because this representation idea is also commensurate with the idea that the that the mind is distinct from the brain that the that you can have images and representations and they're not tied to the body they just exist out there in some sort of virtual or mental kind of space and they're not attached to the body and the new version and the new understanding is that they don't exist independent of the body. They are the brain and mind are not separate things. They're, they're the same. You can't talk about the one independent of the other. And so there aren't these separate images or these separate, they are body. They are manifestation, dynamic manifestations of body. So I think we need to be a little bit careful about because I think we get stuck into particular ways of thinking about the world when we go back to the representational approach. And then the, the, the body-based approach leads us into new avenues of thought about these things. Not sure if you follow me exactly. But, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> well, I, I could just riff on that briefly. Uh, and uh, I will ask forgiveness in advance for, for going into it a computer metaphor, but it reminds me a little bit of networking and the, the way that distributed applications work compared to like local applications or the way that like a network based processing or network based storage would work compared to a centralized storage system. Uh, and like, if you imagine that, uh, the word, you know, the, the, the image of a forest, for example, exists purely in my representational space as some kind of like encapsulated storage file, if you will, on my hard drive, on my particular, you know, body mind hard drive, then you know, that's that imply that already presupposes a individualist uh, and an atomistic ontology, right? However, if you imagine that that seeing of the forest or that sensing of what a forest is, is actually distributed amongst all the brain minds that have ever encountered a forest and gets individualized through your particular perspective, but is not separate from th that of others, then it leads to a different sense of what I think individuality is and also what potential is. Because part of what we experience as our potential is co-determined by the systems, the structures, the ensembles, biosocial, psycho ensembles that we're all a part of and that are, you know, constantly churning us out. Uh, and if those systems are designed for certain outcomes, right, if the technological systems are designed to maximize profits for a few, you know, huge corporations, and that's really the, 
parameters within which communications are, are, are happening, political power is being exerted, etc. That's going to forestall the kinds of a, a kind of dis- distribution of the capacities that you're notice that you're highlighting in John. Uh, and I think that are highlighted in you know anybody who does creative work, anybody who really cultivates the interiors begins to work with that space. And that is, I mean, to circle it back, it is an erotic space because there's constantly exchange going on there. And it happens through the medium of language. It happens through the medium of communications technology, culture. Like we're exchanging, just like we're exchanging, uh, I don't know what to call it, spirit, really, uh, through our, through these kinds of events. Uh, And just to finish, and Jung says something about this too. His idea of the genius is a, is some is one who creates seeds that propagate seeds that take on a life of, of of their own. I think that that notion could really be, you know, it doesn't it it could be democratized. It's not just the great the great man who's the genius. The genius function uh, comes through these network effects just as much. And so, if we were to redirect our systems towards the cultivation of inner riches, towards the cultivation of real, you know, the heaven on earth, uh, the Buddhaverse, like whatever you wanted to call it. If, if we were to do that collectively as a culture, as a community, but then throw out the seeds so that it propagates, as we've already caught the seeds ourselves, we didn't make this up. Uh, that to me is really a promising direction for, for us to go in terms of potential. Uh, because we could have a much, a much better world uh, if we if we put our minds to it. Can I pick up on that? Because I have a comment hmm? about just about what I foresee, and I hope we can talk about it in the future. Is this the Listening Society book, which I don't know if you completed, but that that's my best articulation of the political side of actually achieving this for the the whole and um, through small, small steps of meditation in schools, little, little itty bitty changes here and there. It's the only way collectively to do that. But um, I just want to throw that in there. I hope we can discuss that at some point because that's, it is a pretty good book. Um, But go ahead, Ed. I just wanted to pick up on what Marco had said. I, I really appreciate when John shares with us his experiences that he has. Those are experiences that I never have. Ever. I've tried, I've worked on them, I've done the techniques, I, you know, whatever and what is. But I don't I don't have those kind of experiences. I also don't have the opportunity to go off and meditate for two weeks somewhere. My my life didn't play out that way. My life was always engaged with my family, my children, my job, my whatever it is. That's where I find myself. That's the world in which I live. And it's not ethereal and it's not, it's not detached. It's very, very real. And it's, it's very much full of feeling, but it's not, how am I as the, and I, I'll call myself that for the lack of a better thing to say right now, but I'm just an everyday Joe. And how am I supposed to relate to somebody who has visions or went off and meditated and says, oh, this is the way we should be. All I can say is, well, that's nice for you. That's great. You, you did that, and you experienced that, but why don't you get off that horse and come over here and do my job for a while? And then the world looks a whole hell of a lot different. And my whole striving has always been that if you want, if you want to get it, whatever it is, you've got to get it here, now, in the nitty-gritty of everything that's going on. And that's the only place that you're ever going to. I have my issue with a lot of what I hear out of, we commune in them and we read things from, from people that are there, but, it's, but it's, it's a detachment that they have from real life. The, the real everyday life of everyday people doesn't play out like that. We're 7 billion people on the planet. I'd like to know how many lucid dreamers there are. I love lucid dreamers. I think they're great. And I love every time somebody shares one with me. 
But it, and what am I supposed to feel in relation to that? I can't do that. I don't have some capability. Yeah, we can cultivate lots of things. But a little fundamental interhuman acceptance goes a whole hell of a long way before we ever get to anything else that may take us to some higher plane. That's the only issue that I have with, with these things. I, I love the fact that people have grandiose ideas. I enjoy reading them and talking about them. But the, the real life story is in the end. I just get my sh the shit kicked out of me day in and day out. <laughs> that, that's the way it, it goes. But I don't, I'm not complaining because, well, that's, that's basically how life is. And it's okay. And I see, and I, and this is, this is the, it's not mas sadomasochism that's at play, but there's an actual beauty and an enjoyment in that because I can see in that getting the shit kicked out of you where the sublime is. And that's kind of like looking in the other direction. There's a story in the Gospel of Thomas where the di disciples and Jesus are walking down the road and they see a dead dog. And he's rotting out there in the sun and the disciples goes, oh man, look at that rotting corpse. And Jesus says, look how his teeth shine. They're like diamonds. It's just how you look at the shit that you're in. <laughs> but we tend to be told from others, and this is, the, 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 this is where I'm, I'm really thankful for what we do here in the cafes and on infant conversations. We engage one another. We talk to one another about that. We just don't get told things. Sure, we read stuff and somebody throws it out and somebody else is going, oh, okay, well, I don't agree. But they'll tell you why. And they'll tell you how they see it. And then you realize, well, we actually we have big areas of overlap, you see. And it's in that interaction. It's in that, that back and forth that we have. And those are all very, in, in many regards, surreal experiences that we have every day. But we don't judge them because that's just every day. And that's the thing. That's why. So it's really nice that some people have got it all figured out. But in the end, I haven't. And I got to live my life. Um, can I respond? Um, I, should hope I, think, so. I think it's great that we, we have differences that make a difference. Yeah. And Jeffrey mentioned cognitive psychology and some of the debates going on within cognitive psychology that have been going on for decades. And then the theory of mind about, and the, the theory that the brain and the mind are the same. I, I don't know if I misquoted you or not, Jeffrey, but I know that debate's an ongoing one. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, I've, I've had to wash dishes from a very early age and chop wood and carry water. Um, and also, also, I think there are, are different kinds of reality that we can articulate, point to, and share with humans and non-humans. I also am reminded in response to the whole uh, cognitive psychology dilemma about the, the relationship of brain and mind that um, there are a lot, there's been a lot of research about how fluid and um, flexible the brain is and how the brain changes according to how it's used. So if you play the piano or you dance or you sing or you do all kinds of, or, or drive a cab in London, you're going to be changing your brain. And I believe that we humans can tune into all kinds of different activities. Um, and we have a very wide spectrum that we can choose from. And these will uh, shape our brains and our nervous systems in relationship with an environment. Um, but at the same time, I don't, I don't agree that you can, there's an equivalence that the brain and the mind are the same or that the, or that the brain causes the mind. Certainly there's a correlation. Um, but I'm very careful because I believe that the brain, like Aldous Huxley in his later years, um, and I think Dorset Perception said that the brain was a, was a reducing valve 
that it was basically a barrier keeping out a great deal for very legitimate reasons um, so that we could function in a certain way in a certain environment and that um, this was this is a, there are certain codes that's encoded in our nervous system but um, he suggests and I believe that it's true that um, a, a new kind of human could come forward that could um, use its nervous system in a certain environment in certain ways that would bring forth different kinds of worlds. And he had a dystopian novel, Brave New World. He also had a utopian novel called The Island, which he wrote at the end of his life, which almost no one reads, including me. I've heard of it though, where he talks about a race of people who are uh, polyamorous. They're no longer um, caught up in um, you know, procreative sex. They have um, different kinds of tempo rhythms and they have um, learned how to be a breath-based consciousness rather than a fear-based muscle, uh, neuromuscular locked down consciousness, which I think is very widespread among us now. I think most of us are locked down most of the time in these neuromuscular locks but that a new breath consciousness can occur in those special occasions. We all have them in the trance states or making love or walking on the beach with someone we care about. We open up and we contact the field. Sometimes if we take drugs or alcohol or go too far, we get lost in that field. So I think that's very wise to know there has to be a center before I can enter into that field in a productive and creative way. So in, those the, are just in the island book, they, they have the Marna bird, which just const constantly squawks out attention, 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 attention. And yes. that, that kind of, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's all about I attention. Didn't interrupt you there. No, no, no. I think that was a very, you were completing what I was aiming to articulate, but thank you. It's the best at mind reading I can do, but... Uh, <laughs> I will have to go in five minutes, so um, I do want you all to stay as long as you possibly can. No, no need to stop just because I happen to somewhat host this conversation and I don't have any direction. I'd like for it to go now. Um, so I thank you all for this great conversation so far. I um, guess we can take it anywhere at this point. Did anybody have any questions? Or no, I'd, I'd just like to say I'm glad you brought it up. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're, you're trying to get at something too. And mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to, it's, you know, it can be hard to say what you really mean. And it may not be even clear yet. It may just be a, something that emerges through the process of, of dialoguing about it. I know that's the case with, for me, a lot of the times is I have ways of articulating things that I know are inadequate to what the thing actually is, but get me kind of more or less in that direction. They're kind of rough sketches. And I know that if I put them out uh, and, you know, there's some dialogue about them, something, some greater clarity often comes out of that process. It may not come immediately. However, it can come later. It could come in a dream. It could come through any, uh, through any <laughs> <You're vectors. respected>. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so, <laughs> that, you know, I think part of the, what I like about what we're doing is when we could sort of see the meta perspective and see how, what what at a close range and at a narrow focus may look like chaos from a wider vantage point actually has an elegance to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we get with the puffer fish. Uh, I think that's part of what's going on, you know, in religious and religious communities and religions where we're, they're creating these kinds of mandalas, these inner temp, these temples for inner experience. And uh, I think we almost can't help but do it. And that's part of why, I, I, I sympathize with the puffer fish is because mm -hmm. I feel that there is, there is a limit to, to what we can see about the meaning of what, of our, of our actions, even though from our own vantage point, they, 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 they can seem to have to be you know, about us. <laughs> and so uh, as much as we could sort of get that vantage point, um, I think it makes things a little bit smoother. Like it gives us some, 
some sense, some more, uh, I'm, I certainly get anxious about things a lot and about the state of the world and whether or not I'm achieving my potential and what, whether or not I'm achieving my visions. But, uh, but it's, it's good to have some other minds to help distribute that, that, <laughs> um, contextual. Yeah, that, eyes. yeah <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> that, that's part of how I see my, not necessarily a role, but I, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm younger than all of you here. I, I assume I'm the youngest, not that age has anything to do with it, but I, I didn't grow up in an academic realm. I didn't pursue the philosophy degree or I don't have multiple books behind me at any given time. And for me, this is the perfect location to explore. And I have uh, pretty good minds here, yeah. <laughs> the four of you. And you, you all help me out so much more than you can even imagine. Um, I, I say this with the Quaker group I'm in and just it, it literally, when I, when I said I, I wasn't stimulated, I, I literally was not stimulating myself. I, I could blame my parents or whatever. That was one of my first conversations I had with you all in the conversation uh, cafes, but to actually finally come around to the communication aspect for me and to get out of that singular mode of, anxiety and I don't have anxiety for the world. I have anxiety. Of, well, I have so much to say and I want to get it out and I never articulated it. So mm -hmm. to be able to have this hour and a half discussion on some random question I had uh, is pretty amazing. And mm -hmm. we, we definitely fleshed it out a bit here and um, yeah, I'm going to head on out. Um, mm -hmm. Please Sp speaking give, of the give me at least 30 minutes of, Good material that I'm not going to listen to now. <laughs> speaking like on the video comes. Speaking of the Quaker group, Doug, uh, um, there's a lot in Quakerism to look at too. It might might be something. I don't know if anybody else is interested, but it might be something worth doing at some point. Mm -hmm. I think it'll it'll loosely tie into everything we're doing here. Whether we Marco and uh, John and I discussed, kind of just taking elements of quicker discussion into our discussion, the silence, as you've mentioned before. And um, once we reach a realm of chaotic, not necessarily everybody jumping over themselves, but chaotic thought, let's kind of hone it back down and, or not see it as coming from our mind, maybe see it as like, let's, let's try to access the light or mm. the whatever it might be rather than uh, the latest idea we had in the book we read yesterday or something. But yeah, I, I appreciate that, Jeffrey. And I hope we can continue ex to explore all of our or others' ideas. All right. Ta ta. No. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye. <laughs>um, it's nice to just kind of throw something out and, and, you know, see what comes of it because it does get kicked around and it does get, um, like get shed on it from d different sides that we wouldn't see otherwise. And I, I think that's a good thing. You know, I'm, I'm actually very happy that we have the opportunity to do that. I don't have the time to go off for two weeks and meditate. So I have to do it here. <laughs> A lot of jabbering going on, but that's you no. Know. I I had a, a meditation teacher after I was having some very weird experiences. She told me, "Stop meditating. <laughs> you don't need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do yourself a favor. Let yeah, up." She said, she said uh, most people meditate to open up. Yeah, yeah. They're already <laughs> wide open. <laughs> and she said, your job is to integrate. Is to integrate your experience. Yeah. Which is much harder for me yeah. than it is yeah. for a lot of people because their experience is fairly narrow. 
and you know it's it's not easy to find words and I think the secret body that Kripal is talking about, actually, Ed, um, I would differ with you. I hope this is a difference that makes a difference. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are having visions, mm -hmm. not body experiences and near-death experiences and uh, paranormal events and tele telekinesis and telepathy and mm -hmm. all these things. And I think only a tiny fraction of it is getting reported. Oh, oh, and I would agree with you, John. I, I, the repercussions are enormous if you tell the wrong person. That's that's correct. I, I agree on that point. <clears throat> the only thing that I was saying is, I don't. I think, let's put it this way. This isn't a contest, but I think there are more people on this planet that are like me than are like you right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and and I mean that. I mean that in the best of ways, because I think you you also said the key thing, John. Your meditation, meditation teacher told you, stop meditating. Right. Stop moving. At, shut it down. From, get out of this. Now, if you have no idea. Shut it down. She said to integrate it. Is what right. She so if you have no idea what's happening to you, and this starts happening to you, you you're in, a, you're in a, a hot pot of water, you see. And a lot of people who, I don't know how many there are, who then in, encounter that will shut it down just out of what Marco said at the beginning, either out of awe or fear, because it's just a natural reaction. I, I, I can't deal with this right now. Right. Now, most people I know, and, and for the, you know, and I'll, I'll count myself to them too. We, we've got so much of whatever it is that we have for potential buried under whatever it is that we've done and that it hardly ever gets out. And I really do think, and, and this is not a criticism of people, and this is not a, this is not a condemnation of them or anything, but I just think most people have more to do with getting themselves sorted in any kind of way before they get themselves sorted in a higher kind of way. Even if they start having experience, because we all do. I mean, I've had psychic experiences, quote unquote, in mild degrees. I've had my meditational experiences seldom you know, it's not like it never happens. I, I think I mentioned one of these things. I have a still small voice. When it speaks, I listen. It took me forever to figure out that when it speak, I, spoke, I had to listen. But I finally did. And I do think that that is relatively common. But our everyday experience doesn't lend itself to that. We have moments of it. And they're usually special moments. And, and unfortunately, I think that when people do have those special moments, they don't know what to do with them. Because it is so different from their everyday reality. And it is hard to simply say to someone, you know, I had this really weird feeling when I was doing this because of what, what most people, I think, and it is the majority, would, would react. Be because we're not, we're not open to those kind of things. Mm. I've, I've had the, the real benefit of being exposed to lots of people that have had lots of, I mean, really intense, life-changing experiences. And I'm very grateful that I've had that opportunity, even though I haven't had them myself. You say, I, I can only get them by, vicariously. But it is very, very difficult for most people to even, to even think of it. Where I grew up, you could literally still get stoned for saying something. No. Oh, me too. Oh, yeah. you, you would know that as well because... I, you know, wait, I, I got stoned. Yeah, see? <laughs> they, they beat the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm and, you. and they threw rocks at me and they... Yeah. There was yeah. a ditch and they threw me into it. I mean, I've been traumatized. Yeah, yeah, I know. Not you just mentally, that? but physically right. attacked. On, and I'm talking about on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. I've been attacked. Because mm. I was walking down the street with a man who looked effeminate. They threw mm. rocks at us. Bunch yeah, of, yeah. Bunch of yeah, kids. Yeah. So it's happening, you know. So these are very yeah. deep. But uh, you know, I, it's a lot of people have got to move beyond, yeah. so that we can move beyond these traumas and tap into that transcendence, which mm -hmm. I believe we all would agree it would be a value to our. It would be. I agree, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. But but we grow up in a society which, I mean, our education system sits on our sensitivity and squashes the life out of it. I mean, oh, it's yeah. hard to keep any sense of sensitivity through yeah. the system that we grow up with. And, you know, so I, I don't think it's because people don't have those sensitivities. I think it's because they get 
squeezed out of them during the process of growing up and becoming right. an adult. Or repressed or suppressed or pushed down or buried or whatever. Uh, you know, there's lots of ways to describe I agree with you uh, 100%. Or, or they turn into addictions. People go shopping uh-huh. or they get uh-huh. drunk in front of yeah. a TV set just simply because they have no efficient way of uh, integrating these experiences and, and making them a part of a, a communal, a communal um, response. Because some or, of us or, just or, can't go to church on Sunday and get it and get anything out of that experience. Or, or for instance, the whole process of tattoos and um, and uh, and scarification is all part of that. I mean, this is a a need to connect in a way. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a channeled way to do it, but. And some of it is beautiful, but some of it seems to me to come out of a real victim kind of mentality. Um, I see people scarring themselves and sticking, you know, safety pins into their lips. It's sort of weird. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm weird. And I, you know, I'm, yeah, I know. Where, I gonna say, so where do you draw that line? <laughs> where, where's the weird line? Exactly. <laughs> but I. What? I think that dates us, though, John. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I think that dates us or ages us. I mean, <laughs> the generation that does that now. It's right. Even closer, you know. So. Right. But maybe what um, Doug was trying to point to or get at with this question was or an alternative phrasing or derivative phrasing of it would be something along the lines of, a thought experiment like what would a society look like what would a world look like in which uh our human individual and inter-individual souls really could flourish uh and where it wasn't fighting against some kind of oppressive uh array of forces that are channeling you toward profitable you know ends for the power keepers but really was set up to allow for human flourishing would that be a kind of fulfillment a kind of realization of a potential that is only sporadically and, um, you know, uh, under much duress realized in, in the current scheme of things. Well, I was going to say, it sounds like it, to me, it brings us back to what Ed was saying. So one of the interesting things, so when I was thinking through the process of coming up with my future society in my book, one, you know, I said, okay, we have these, these, um, um, technologies in as cellular level technologies that allow us to update our bodies, to change our interactions with the environment. We don't have to worry about survival because all of that's taken care of. So what is left? Well, you're still left with your anguishes. You're still left with your, your, your difficulties living. You're still left with the data, data humdrum of life. You know, I mean, uh, those things are somehow they're what's the per, per, perennity uh, perennial mm-hmm. perennial. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah, yeah. perennial. Those are the things that two thousand years from now, three thousand years from now, people are still going to be struggling. Yeah, I don't with think them. they're. I don't think they're going away either, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so the ideal world of the future, the the sort of utopia which I think is a really interesting idea and one that I enjoy exploring. Mm-hmm. But uh, it doesn't mean to say that all of a sudden people are going to not be stuck with their noses in the day-to-day life. I mean, that's what life, human life is about, really, mm-hmm. in a way. So, <laughs> Well, I'm just reminded of um, the, the, uh, dystopian novels or utopian novels, and Aldous Huxley, of course, wrote both um, a utopian and a dystopian novel. Um, but I find it really compelling that um, I think he wrote that in the in the late fifties, early sixties. That uh, the island, I believe, but I may be wrong about the dates. But it, it sort of mirrors this. Um, the sixties was a, a an eruption of a, like a nature mysticism happened on a very large scale, and not just in the U.S. but in Europe as well. And um, we saw this in the sixties. Uh, that sort of you know, east-west sort of opening up. Um, And then we saw it crushed by Reaganomics and Margaret Thatcher and just a wave of uh, cannibal capitalism. And that's been going on for about 30 30 years now. 
And so I'm curious, this is an open question, a research question. I think maybe Doug would be a, a good person to discuss this with because he's he likes working with the elderly. That the now that the baby boomers are moving towards retirement, and um, maybe they'll have a little more leisure than they did when they were chopping wood and carrying water and raising kids and all of that stuff to start to reflect a little bit about uh, what happened. And um, I believe now that we have the internet, we have opportunities to reconnect, we might start to see some of that, that uh, the liberation that started to happen in the 60s and they got crushed, I think. Some of it might start to open up again, those capacities. Um, and, um, you know, so that the 60s uh, can resurge what we learned and also the excesses of the 60s, what we need to uh, drop. Um, maybe we can start to revitalize. And I'm, I'm, when I love what uh, Oscar Wilde said, you, uh, a map without utopia is not worth looking at. And I def definitely agree. I'm definitely, a, a, I consider myself a radical utopian. Yeah, yeah. And it gets me into a lot of trouble. And I'm <laughs> infinitely more disappointed, I think, than people who are basically uh, nihilists who just want to fuck everybody and make a lot of money on Wall Street. There are a lot of them out there who are doing just that in this city that I live in. So they're very driven by very short-term, narrow focus. So I'm just saying, you know, maybe... There's an in-between where we can just have a little more of an open focus rather than such a narrow focus that's so ego-driven. We all have our egos, and we need to keep those egos. I don't think we should get rid of them anytime soon. Um, but I think we can, you know, sort of move back and forth and oscillate between these different dimensions much more creatively than we have done. So that's what I would like us to be moving towards, a, a collective compelling future that could hold all of those uh, different impulses, integral and not integral impulses. Because mm -hmm. like you said, Ed, there are people who are just not going to get on, who have no interest in this. And we have to find a way of living with them. Mm -hmm. And loving them also. And loving them, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our development depends upon their development. And they may be having a loyal opposition to God, you know, mm -hmm. even though I think they're definitely in the zone, which I would call evil. Um, but that may be something that's required. So I'm just hoping we can move towards something more ecological. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We got now a post, a post capitalist, post individualist uh, world would be ideal. But you, like, like I said, Jeffrey, still their life sucks and it probably always will. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't have to suck in these particular ways. It could suck in better ways, right? Well, or more uh, interesting ways. Well, maybe maybe not better, maybe in other it, ways. Right? Maybe not better. Sure. <laughs> I mean, well, aren't you tired of the way the world sucks now? Wouldn't it be better if it sucked in more interesting ways? I mean, uh, sure. Well, I mean, here's here's a just a thought. I mean, let's say utopia is closer than we imagine. Let's say that through uh, some emergence of collective genius, uh, a tipping point is reached or whatever. I mean, there's various stories around this, but where we're able to redesign global systems in a much more ecological manner, throw in some permaculture, throw in integral, you know, throw in all the all the good approaches, theories, meta theories, ideas about how things could can improve and not totalitarian, just you know, mutual human flourishing around the planet, that suddenly liberates a whole lot of bandwidth, uh conscious bandwidth for dealing with other things, right? If you don't have to worry about getting a paycheck, about the climate, you know, self-destructing in the next, you know, in your lifetime or your children's lifetime, what then becomes possible? I, I think that, you know, if that energy were liberated, that intelligence, just that brain power, brain mind power, whatever you want to call it, is liberated, uh, the sky's the limit, right? The cosmos is the limit. Anything really can happen. And, I, you know, it's so counterfactual. It's so idealistic. But if we don't have that, if we can't at least play that game and move our attention in that in that direction, I mean, to at least as a contrast to where it tends to go now, 
then then I think we're really lost uh, because we're just spinning in a void essentially with with no uh, exit. We're in a labyrinth, like we were talking about at the very very beginning. The very beginning before, yeah. we, before we took various turns uh, in, in this lab in the labyrinth of this conversation. Uh, so we we um, met last week with a writing group. We talked a little bit about Ursula Le Guin. Here's another writer who explored utopias and explored them in a non sort of idealistic way, in a way, because, for example, the dispossessed and that whole Hainish world that she paints across various novels, she called it an ambiguous utopia. Mm. And part of it is that in her vision of an anarchic society that yeah, it could exist on some parallel planet, uh, there was still other issues. Uh, but the love, but, but there was a different ground. And the love could flow between people, there could be ex solidarity, there was relative autonomy between people, there wasn't this uh, idolatry of money, money this mammoth, mammonocracy. Mm -hmm. We could certainly move beyond that, right? Uh, there could be imperfection, but not shrouded in, in, in um, the dominion of evil. <laughs> that I think we're... There, there will be constraints always. And those constraints can be extremely creative. You can't have freedom without constraints. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we, that's why we're here, is to work with these constraints so that we can enjoy freedom. And I believe that, um, you know, this is uh, built into us. You know, the mm -hmm. transcendence can't happen without constraints. Then you can transcend those constraints, and then you have more constraints coming at you. That's what life is. So... Um, I just hope we can can be more versatile than we have been with the constraints that are given to us. Hmm. That's that's one side of the coin, John, and I agree. And I think it's very important that we still have these um, visions that that we can aspire to. I, I think that's very motivating. I always talk about whom I believe are the majority of people who don't see these visions and don't have them, but. I, I do firmly believe that loving your neighbor as yourself gives that person the feeling that that vision is expressing. And if we can do that, I, I, I'm one of these people who believes that when the revolution happens, it is going to be from the bottom up and for completely different reasons than we think. Because it's actually how we engage every other human being that we encounter that makes the real difference in the world not in what we would like to see or would hope to see. I, those are all good things to have, and there are things that we should carry with it. And e even a curmudgeon like myself has a couple of those in the back just for, you know, the odd sunny day that shows up and goes, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be nice if? Yeah, but um, because you got to have those too. But, it's, you know, to me, the nitty-gritty is, and this is what you do also with the, the, you know, like the elderly that you engage with, you know, you engage them for who they are because they are. There's no more reason or justification. Or, you know, it's it's really very fundamental and very simple. And if I could just get my neighbor to do that three times a week instead of zero times a week, I would have. I would believe that that the world would transform in a shorter period of time than we think it would. Yeah. But you know, but we're still tied up in ah, oh, but his his dog shits on my lawn, and you know, he never cleans it. You know, we're still stuck there. But, you know, so there's lots of little things we just have to get past, but we have to, we have to, you know, recognize that, that, that there is this other who's just like me in the end. And, you know, that, to me, that's the, always the first step I'm trying to get people to see. You know, it's not really that much different. Well, you know, I'm not, I don't think everyone needs to lucid dream or have out-of-body experiences. No, I, I know that's why you're the perfect example to your yeah. call upon. <laughs> But that's what I can, I can hang out and do that stuff. And you yeah. can, you can learn Hebrew, mm -hmm. you know, do presentations on the Hebrew alphabet. I can't mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. But Jeffrey does physics mm -hmm. and Marco does a lot of things too. <laughs> well, <laughs> he he brought, does a lot of things. Yeah. He's, <laughs> brought, he's, he's used the technology that. to bring us together so we can yeah. have this discourse yeah. event. Yeah. So, yeah. so we're all doing the best we can with what we've got. See, and that's and I'm that's totally in, yeah. I depend on the, the kindness of strangers every day. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, I I can tell, you know, I that was such That's a delight. Cool. Experience. John. <laughs> you know, after that old man told me I looked like a romantic poet, and after these young ladies gave me this balloon, I started to feel like a romantic poet. Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have been sky high myself. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I felt great for the rest of the day. So those kind of serendipities happen. You well, know? you shared but it with us, John. I'll probably feel good for the rest of the day, too. <laughs> Aren't you a romantic poet already? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I aspire to be. Yeah. <laughs> I sort of need a lot of a lot of oh, colleagues. I need oh, my yeah. colleagues here to uh, to correct me and to inspire yeah. inspire us. And I, okay. I think. Oh, well, you must be doing a good job, uh, John. Somebody recognized it. <laughs> yes. yes. It's total, this sweet old man. What a, what a blessing he gave me. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you can't pay for that, can you? <laughs> I'm reading The Lord of the Rings with my daughter right now. And, oh, really? Uh, so we're, we just finished the first part. And we're into part two. But uh, what's beautiful about that story with myth in general, mm-hmm. literature, the ability to characterize mm-hmm. uh, and to create characters that are fictional or mythological but that express qualities in humans uh, I'm I'm feeling a little a little bit of that right now because I, I, I sense uh, that you know the the three of you, Ed, John, Jeffrey, uh, could almost correspond to to these archetypes or these char- characters in, in Lord of the Rings. I think I think Ed's a, uh, has got some dwarf. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> John Elf, clearly. Okay. Uh, that, that's your okay. that's your race of beings, and Jeffrey, uh, maybe maybe some wizard uh, aspects. Mm-hmm. Of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about you, Marco? Not, I might be a rider. I might be, I might be a... <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to be. No, no, you, you could, no. You could very well be. It it does fit in very well. It's it's odd that you say that because when when people ask me, you know, like, well, where did you grow up? And I say, oh, I'm from Western Pennsylvania, and and I and my I always say it's a nice place to be from right? because I, because I, I don't live there. And I wouldn't want to live there. But the thing when people say, well, what are people like back there? And the, the word that I always used was not dwarf. It was gnome because a gnome is one that's got and, and he kind of describes this with the hobbits, but they're not that way. They get these gnarly root like feet that kind of grab into the earth. You see? And you can't uproot them. You can't get them to go anywhere else. And, and most of the folks back where I grew up were miners. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Everybody worked in the mines or for the mines, you know. So there was this very dwarfishness. You know, I, I read The Lord of the Rings. I'm going, oh, well, gee, that's Western Pennsylvania and over here is upstate New York. You know, <laughs> California is over here uh, kind of thing. And that, that does come up. So um, I actually... I, I almost take it as a compliment for recognizing it, but I'm I'm the dwarf that escaped. I got over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on a quest. I, I am certainly on a quest, I can tell you. No. Um. <laughs> well, it's been good good company. <laughs> um, yeah, I have some good. technical work to do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> there's technology anywhere in the vicinity there's work to do <laughs> uh any any closing words uh you know what let me make actually on the technical uh just uh announcement or uh, mm-hmm. communicate an action plan that came out of a meeting with john and doug earlier i'm creating a group in metapsychosis excuse me on infinite conversations called metamind and uh, I'm going to add you all to it and share a login for Zoom so that you can go in and schedule meetings okay. uh, whenever you'd okay. like. Uh, we recorded a little video with me explaining it. I could condense that actually into, uh, you know, quick start instructions. Okay. And so I wanted to make it possible for other conversations to happen and then for those to get from Zoom onto the forum uh, in some form of video. I'm still working on that last part, just mm-hmm. uploading to uh, to YouTube or Vimeo. 
Uh, but the first part of it, being able to schedule record videos, I'll set that up. And then I really want to let the conversations uh, suggest uh, mm -hmm. occasions for deeper dives through these kinds of events and uh, to not have that depend upon me or upon you know a larger group coordinating schedules and time zones. I'd like to let them happen organically mm -hmm. and then build up our, our um, you know, our milieu, build up our soil so that we can access what each other are you know, is thinking, yeah. doing, saying, cool. and let so it emerge. Automatically <laughs> recorded then? Yeah, we would record them if we had everyone's permission to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you, me, and Ed wanted to hang out one afternoon and discuss a topic, or we wanted to read a, a, an essay, and we didn't want to have to get everybody together, we could do that and record it. And the rest of the group, if they wanted to watch it, could. Mm -hmm. or if you wanted to do something more private, then you would sit, insist on privacy. So we would just right. circulate it, I guess, among ourselves. Mm -hmm. On the, um, what would it be on writer's group? I don't know how to work out that, but I yeah, just, well, well, I, I'm working on that as well. Working on the details. Okay, it's a nice idea. Great idea. Great idea. For what but, you want to do and how to find mm -hmm. things, I think is okay. uh, definitely uh, needed. So cool. Very, very, very aware of that. Just, okay. just, just one last thing. Um, I have a question, and I hope Doug, if he sees this, he'll uh, reflect on it. The question is, is there a relationship between what we have talked about and the possible hum our possible human potential? Mm. And, if, and I would like to know, what, is, what would be the first sign that would let you know that our human potential was being activated? Mm. Um, because my, I suspect that we're already doing it, but we may not be paying attention to it. So I find that interesting because it brings up, I was one of the questions I had was the relationship between possibility and potential because mm. oh, um, yes. I'm mm. more interested in possibility than potential. Yeah, yeah. Um, although I'm not quite sure why and I, I sort of need to get that out. Yeah. So why do John and I agree with you? <laughs> <laughs> the possibility rather than the potential is the more interesting question. Because uh. <laughs> in a way, I sense we've already, mm -hmm. this is utopia right now. <laughs> we've hit the jackpot. <laughs> no, no, you got the balloons, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, sh I'll share one with you. <laughs> we'll find a way of transporting them. <laughs> Those don't quite work as well as real ones, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. It's just true. Something to work on. Good job. All right. Until, until we can manifest virtual balloons and send them, <laughs> send them through some cyberspace. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was a great evening again. Have uh -huh. a great one. Okay. Great. Enjoy.